Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. So as many of you may know, one of my favorite ways to find new investment ideas is to study what the best investors in the world are doing. And I often do this through something called a 13F filing. So if you're based in the US and you manage more than 100 million US dollars, then every single quarter you are obliged by the SEC to disclose all of the stocks that you own at the end of each quarter. And there's various third party websites which basically take those 13F filings, compare them to what the 13F filing looked like last quarter and the quarter before that and the quarter before that. And over time we can build up a bit of a history of the stocks that many of the best investors in the world have been buying or selling or holding. And this is a phenomenal resource for the small investor really looking to get a constant funnel of kind of new ideas coming towards them. And if we can have new stocks that people like Mona Pabrai or Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett have bought, uh, in many ways they're sort of acting like our unpaid analysts. And it's really already gone through a lot of filters uh, from those super investors themselves before it lands on those 13F filings. So if we can have this list of stocks to look into that have already passed through some pretty harsh filters, it really can be quite a good hunting ground to operate in. Now each quarter here on the channel, I actually do a 13F update video. And in that video, I basically go through a small sort of handful of investors that I follow really closely. Uh, that core group tends to stay kind of the same every, every quarter and every quarterly video update that I do. And typically I add in maybe one or two new investors that maybe some people haven't heard of before. But in this video, I basically want to disclose the entire full list of super investors that I follow and of 13Fs that I look at. So I wanna spend maybe 30 seconds or so on each investor on this list, maybe a little more for some, a little less for others. Um, and I want to give you my full list of about 16 super investors whose 13Fs I look at. And uh, within a couple of them, I wanna give some sort of honorable mentions as well, which will make a little bit more sense in a sec. But um, without further ado, let's get straight into the video and I hope you enjoy. Okay, so let's get straight into it. Now with each of these super investors, uh, I'm gonna give you basically the investor's name, uh, the fund name, because that can be a bit different when you're searching a 13F filing. And uh, this isn't possible for all of the investors on this list, but where it is possible, I've tried to give you their compounded annual return over a certain period of time as well, so that you can get a feel for the actual returns that these investors have generated. So um, let's start right from the top and get some kind of obvious ones out of the way. So the first one is Warren Buffett. Uh, I don't think I need to spend too long talking about why I follow Warren Buffett, whose company is Berkshire Hathaway. Greatest investor of all time, uh, as of 2020, had a compounded annual return of about 21% per year. If you include both of his early Buffett partnerships and his uh, more recent time, you know, the bulk of his career managing Berkshire Hathaway. But with Berkshire, there are actually a couple of honorable mentions. So uh, at Berkshire, there is not just Warren Buffett managing the portfolio. He also has a couple of portfolio managers that manage, uh, that manage smaller amounts of money. It's about 10 or $15 billion, I think, last time we got an update. And that is uh, Todd Combs and Ted Weschler, who are both really, really good investors in their own right. So when you are looking at Berkshire Hathaway's 13F, it really does, I think, pay to pay attention to some of the smaller positions in the portfolio as well. Because the really large positions are almost certainly gonna be Buffett, but the smaller positions are often gonna be Ted and Todd. And they both have phenomenal track records in their own right. Um, I did a video not too long ago about Ted Weschler's retirement account and just the stupendous amount of money that is sitting in that retirement account with uh, investing in only publicly available securities throughout his entire career. He's built an absolute fortune in that account. And I should also mention that from time to time, uh, Todd Combs and Ted Weschler actually file personally as well. So the last time that we saw this was a 13G filing from Ted Weschler. Uh, these are filings that when you sort of reach a certain ownership threshold in a company, you have to file a 13G as opposed to a 13F, which is just kind of a assets under management threshold. Uh, Ted Weschler filed that 13G on the 10th of September 2020, and that was in a company called Dillard's. And since that time, Dillard's has gone up about 500%. So those uh, 13G filings are kind of rare for Ted and Todd, but they're certainly worth paying attention to if they do come out. 
Next on the list, and another fairly obvious one, is Charlie Munger back here. Um, Charlie Munger manages his own personal money, but he also manages the Daily Journal Corporation, which has its own 13F. So uh, last performance update we have from Charlie Munger is back from in the 70s, so he ran his own partnership, uh, compounded in the high 19% a year sort of range. And uh, since then, his returns will basically have mirrored Warren Buffett because he has had the bulk of his fortune in Berkshire Hathaway, which Buffett is running and compounding away at 20% per year. So uh, the Daily Journal Corporation and Charlie Munger is the second one on the list, and that's definitely one to pay attention to. Next one on the list is Monish Pabrai, one of my favorite investors. Uh, his fund is called Pabrai Funds. Sometimes it will show up under... Uh, the name Dalal Street when you search up a 13F. Uh, last performance update I have for Monish Pabrai as of 2021 is a compounded annual growth rate of about 12% per year. Um, he's had kind of a bumpy last few years and had a big drawdown in 2008 and 2009 which really did kind of have a big hit on his long-term performance track record but nonetheless I still think he's a really good one to follow. And final two investors that occur fairly regularly in my 13F updates before we get into some of the, the newer ones uh, is Guy Spear at Aquamarine Capital. Very similar investment strategy to really all of the people that I've mentioned previously. They're fairly concentrated. They've definitely got kind of a value investing orientation. Uh, and those are really the 13Fs that I like to study. I don't want to study people that have 100 different stocks and they're all 1% positions. I want to see people who have real conviction in individual companies and have you know, 5, 10, 20 plus percent of their investment portfolio in one particular stock. So Guy Spear definitely ticks, uh, ticks that one off. And also Lee Lu at Himalaya Capital. So Lee Lu uh, manages some money for Charlie Munger, has a phenomenal track record of about 16% per year compounded. Uh, last update was in 2018, over a period of time where the market only returned about 5 or 6% per year. Okay, so next one on the list is Bill Ackman. Uh, Bill Ackman manages Pershing Square and is fairly well known in the investing world at this point. Uh, Bill has a compounded annual return of about 14% per year as, as of 2019. Uh, he manages a couple of different kind of uh, entities when it comes to the money that he manages. So he has Pershing Square, which is his main sort of publicly listed fund. He also has Pershing Square Taunting Holdings, which is his SPAC. But as far as 13Fs go, we're really paying attention to the core uh, Pershing Square Holdings Fund. So uh, Bill Ackman is very concentrated uh, as a long-term kind of holder of most of his investments and sometimes does a little bit of activism as well. The one thing I will say with Bill Ackman is I don't think he's quite as strict on uh, price as some of these other investors. He does tend to pay up a little bit for some of these businesses, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, by all accounts, one of the best analysts on the planet. So definitely a great one to follow is Bill Ackman. Next up, we have Seth Klarman with the Balpost Group. Uh, last update I have on performance for Seth Klarman is as of 2001, so quite old at this point, about 20 years ago. Um, but at that time, Seth Klarman had compounded at about 13% per year. So um, Seth Klarman, again, one of the most famous value investors on the planet. Um, Bal Balpost Group has performed exceptionally well by all accounts. Also does a little bit of private equity now, I think, Seth Klarman, but he certainly still has a lot of publicly available holdings. Files a 13F, and in more recent years, I've noticed he's kind of drifted towards a lot of kind of tech investing. So if you're interested in the Googles and Facebooks and Microns and so on of the world, um, Seth Klarman will definitely be one to pay attention to to see what he's kind of buying and selling at the moment. Next on the list, we have Norbert Liu from uh, Punch Card Capital, aka Charlie479 on the Value Investors Club, uh, one of the most successful Value Investors Club members in the early days, and someone whose fund was seeded with capital from uh, Gotham Asset Management, which is the fund uh, run by Joel Greenblatt, who started the Value Investors Club. So, uh, as the name suggests with Punch Card Capital, Norbert Liu is not a super active investor. He tends to um, buy stocks very infrequently and holds them for a long period of time. If you look at his 13F at the moment, there's, I think, only about three stocks in there. There are some international ones that you can see as well if you look on a site like Ticker, which shows uh, some of the international holdings. But uh, Norbert Lewis is definitely a great one to follow. As of 2014, he had compounded at about 15% per year. I know he's done very well with some of his recent investments in things like Winnebago and also like uh, Ally Financial. So I wouldn't be surprised if that uh, compounded return of 15% is actually greater if we were to get a more recent update. 
Okay, so next on the list we have Bill Miller. Now, Bill Miller became famous in the investing world because from 1991 through to 2005, he beat the market every single year for all of those years. So a crazy track record from that respect. Bill Miller ran into some massive turbulence, I should say, in 2007, 2008. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie The Big Short, there is a character in The Big Short called, I think it's Bruce Miller, which um, I'm pretty sure is meant to be uh, like Bill Miller equivalent kind of in the movie where, um, you know, this character Bruce Miller is talking about how if Bear Stearns went down, he would, you know, average down on that position and buy more and so on. And uh, we all know kind of what happened to Bear Stearns. It ended up going to zero. So um, he certainly had some some mistakes kind of built into the mix following that 91 to 2005 track record. But he also recovered from the financial crisis exceptionally well. So um, Bill Miller is actually written about in the book Richer, Wiser, Happier. And uh, he was basically buying Amazon stock hand over fist through the financial crisis. He was buying the stock straight up. He was buying call options on the stock. And uh, he apparently put about 1% or so of his net worth into Bitcoin as well, which kind of is an interesting move from a value investor's perspective. I won't comment too much on that. But um, by all accounts, Bill Miller today is the largest holder of Amazon stock. Um, that doesn't have the last name Bezos. So that is just a crazy statistic. Um, he certainly recovered from some heavy losses in 08, 09 to become a very, very wealthy individual today. So he is certainly one to follow. Uh, his fund is called Miller Value Partners. Next on the list, we have a guy by the name of Greg Alexander at Conifer Management. Now, Greg Alexander um, is kind of like a cult figure in the investing world, I would say. And uh, he is someone where there is very, very little information on him. And the reason that he's so well known is because Warren Buffett famously said that there were only maybe two or three people on planet Earth that he would be comfortable giving his money to, you know, to their fund to invest for him. And Greg Alexander was one of those people. So he's also someone that's uh, sort of come to light a little bit more recently because he's one of the super investors that has been buying into Alibaba along with many of the other super investors. So he is certainly one to follow as well. Next on the list, we have Nick Sleep. So uh, I won't say too much on Nick Sleep because I've talked about him in uh, quite a few videos recently, but um, he used to run the Nomad Partnership, now runs a charity called IGY, which is what you will need to look up if you want to find his 13F. He's compounded at about 21% per year, and that update was as of 2013. I suspect his returns have really uh, continued to be quite good as well, considering that he continued to own Amazon, uh, Costco and Berkshire Hathaway personally from 2013 onwards. Only change he's really made since then is to sell about half of his Amazon position to buy into a British company called ASOS. So after Nick's sleep, we have um, probably the person on this list with the best performance track record. Admittedly, it's over a shorter period of time. It's only about over, I think, 10 years. Uh, if that, I will put that up on the screen here if you're, if you're interested. But uh, this is a guy by the name of Cliff Soson of uh, CAS Investment Partners is what you'll have to look up. And uh, Cliff Soson has the craziest performance track record I've seen in a while. So after fees, which he does have quite high fees, actually, he charges 2% for management and also a 20% performance fee. Um, even after those fees, he is compounded at 37% per year. Now, one of the reasons I really like Cliff Soson is because he seems quite open in terms of the different investment opportunities that he will buy into. So he will be, he will buy into like cigar butt style stocks that are just deep value, very cheap opportunities. And he will also buy into some high flyers if he thinks that they're still undervalued because they've potentially got a lot of growth ahead. And um, a lot of his performance is actually explained by one investment in a stock called Carvana, uh, which now makes up over 50% of his fund. So to find someone that is comfortable, being very, very concentrated, and is also open to the really deep value stuff and maybe the slightly more glamorous stuff, but you know things that he think is still undervalued based off its future uh, cash flows and so on. I think that's pretty rare find and uh, the track record is, is insane. So uh, he is definitely one on the list is Cliff Soson. So Cliff Soson I actually heard of um, 
first from Jason on the After Dinner Investor Podcast. Uh, the next person I actually also heard from Jason on the After Dinner Investor Podcast, and that is a guy by the name of David Abrams. Now, uh, David Abrams runs Abrams Capital Management. The last update we have on performance is 15% a year from, I think it was the late 90s, uh, and that track record ended in 2013, so haven't had much of an update since then. Um, but David Abrams actually used to work under Seth Klarman at the Balpost Group, so he's since gone off to kind of do his own thing, and again, runs a pretty similar strategy to a lot of the people that I've talked about. So he's relatively concentrated, he's definitely trying to buy stocks below their intrinsic value, and he is fairly consistently a long-term owner of a lot of these companies as well. Next on the list, we have an investor by the name of Carl Icahn. Now, uh, some of you may know Carl Icahn from his kind of battles he, he's had with uh, someone who we mentioned earlier on the list, which is Bill Ackman. Uh, Carl Icahn is a pretty ruthless, long-time uh, activist investor, one of the earliest activist investors going around, and I've noticed that he continues to uh, do some activism, but he also likes to buy into more of the $0.50 cent dollar type investment opportunities. So I must say I'm really yet to clone anything specifically from Carl Icahn, but uh, I have seen some pretty interesting stuff pop up in his 13F before, so he is certainly one to follow. Uh, Icahn Enterprises or just straight up search Carl Icahn are the couple of things you can look up for the 13F. I don't have a performance track record for Carl Icahn, but um, if you do happen to know that, definitely drop that down in the comments below. So uh, that is Carl Icahn, and we have two to go. So the next one on the list is Tom Gaynor. Now, uh, Tom Gaynor is actually the co-CEO of a business called Markel, and Markel is often referred to as sort of the baby Berkshire. It is a publicly listed insurance company, and Tom Gaynor, just like Buffett at Berkshire, um, basically invests the float from those insurance companies. And uh, he has beaten the market by, I think, a modest amount over time. Um, but he also has sort of the underlying leverage in the insurance company of having that float. So if you look at the stock for Markel, it's performed exceptionally well. Uh, and he's certainly one to follow as well. So Tom Gaynor is not the type of investor you will see just go out and put 10 or 20% of the portfolio in a new position over time. Uh, he's also written about in Richer, Wiser, Happier, and he's someone that makes sort of smaller adjustments around the edges over time, but he's looking to kind of constantly fine tune that portfolio. So he is also an interesting one to follow along with. And the final investor on the list here we have is David Tepper of Appaloosa LP. So David Tepper again has a spectacular tra track record. Last update I can find is as of 2014 and he's returned about 27% per year. So crazy good returns. Uh, David Tepper again is quite uh, one of these concentrated value focused investors. He is probably a little more tech focused again than some of the other people on this list. I know that he was one of the first ones to bet kind of really big on a uh, business like Micron. And we then saw people like Monish Pabrai and Lee Lu and Guy Spear and so on uh, kind of follow David Tepper into Micron. So there you have it. That is my list of super investors that I like to follow every single quarter. Uh, before we wrap the video up, I do have uh, one shout out to do, which is to a Twitter account and a guy on Twitter by the name of Enrico La Quattra. Uh, Enrico, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, he is actually the account where I got a lot of those performance uh, kind of stats from for these different investors. So big shout out to Enrico and definitely go and check out his Twitter account if you haven't uh, come across it already. But that's it from me for this one. And that is my list of super investors if you do think there's any kind of big ones that i've missed or investors that you're following as well i'm always interested to hear kind of new super investors to follow so definitely drop that down in the comments below but like i say that's it from me for this one and i will see you in the next video cheers